Welcome into Other People's Shoes. I'm your host, Neil, and today I'm excited to sit down with my guest, Heather. Heather, in my mind, has a very unique perspective. See, she grew up in the church. Then she left the church. Now she's come all the way back to the church. Stay tuned for her exciting journey on why she came back to the church in our continued series on You Lost Me. I hope you're ready, because you know I am. So here we go. Hey, come take a walk with me. Not like you usually do. Do something different and put yourself in other people's shoes. Open up your mind and open up your eyes and change your direction. Change your perspective. Welcome into Other People's Shoes. I'm your host, Neil, and today we sit down with Heather. Hello, Heather. Hello, Neil. How are you? I'm well. So my practice is, is I don't like to give last names. So sure. it's up to you. You don't have to do that. We'll just stick with Heather. But um, we're talking about, and, and you have a great story, and I can't wait to hear it. We're talking about why people leave church. And mm-hmm. you have a very unique perspective from what I hear, mm-hmm. is that you started out going to church, and we're going to get into that, and then you left, mm-hmm. which you probably have your reasons why you left. And then now you've come back. So it's this like full circle. And I got to be honest, there's probably not a lot of people, at least in my realm of thinking, there's not a lot of people in that category who once were or who once started, who once were, and then who once are again. Mm -hmm. There's just very few of you, I think, out there. So, but before we get into that, we got to take care of one little uh, piece of business. Heather, what shoe size do you wear? (laughs) I wear a seven. You wear a seven? Yes. Okay. Okay. And do you have a favorite pair of shoes? I do. They are a very red, pointy, uh, platinum leather. Carlos Santana. Absolutely love them. What? So what are they like a heel or are yes, they a boot? They are a okay, heel so so help me d- describe this to me. Okay. Like you're you're doing great on that. So um, do you know what? They're kind of. A candy apple red color. Okay. So they're really shiny. Right. And they come to a very peak point at the toe. Um, and they're stiletto, so they're tall. They make, I'm not a very... So they make you taller. They make me much taller. <laughs> yes, make me probably more average height. So, yes. But I I absolutely love those shoes. They are your favorites. They are my favorite. Do you only have one pair or do you have multiples? Nope, I just have one pair. And how often do you wear them? Um... Not very often at all. So they're all. they're special occasion. Yes. Okay. All yes. right. The reason why I lead with that is we're in your shoes today. Oh, okay. So that's the idea, right? We're walking in these uh, Carlos Santana stiletto heels, which if you're trying to visualize me wearing those, um, <laughs> let's knock that off right right yeah. now. No. So there we go. So <laughs> so Heather, let's get into this. Let's let's jump right okay. in. What is your church story like? Like where does it start? And, and just maybe kind of break that down for us. Okay. Um, well, first off, we'll just start at the very beginning. Yeah. Um, my parents always made sure I was in Sunday school. When I was younger, my parents didn't go to church, but they made sure that um, I'm the youngest of six. So they made sure all of us went to Sunday school. Um, and we were there every Sunday, maybe not with them, but definitely in, in Sunday school. So there isn't a time I don't remember um, not believing in Jesus and not knowing who he was. Um, and then as I got older, uh, it was right around the age of 13, mom decided that we all needed to go to church. It wasn't just up to the kids to go. So it, it started out with just us girls, uh, my sister and my mom and my grandma. And I was first baptized at 14. So, Did you know what you were doing at 14? No, when you made no. that decision? No, I just knew that that was, um, it was a commandment and that's what my mom wanted me to do. Does that make sense? And it's not that I, I didn't love Jesus at that time. I did. Um, so I did it more because it was a command and less because I knew why I was doing it and um, that I wanted him to be in my life. And to be my Lord and Savior, I just knew that was a, a step, a step to heaven, I guess, is the best way to to describe what I felt at that time. 
Right. So not going down too far down the baptism road, but you believed growing up or the church you were a part of taught that you had to be baptized to get to heaven? That's what I believed. Oh, that's I what w- you believed. That's okay. what I believed. That's what you believed. Um, okay. Because, you know, it was 14, so. Sure. <laughs> but yeah. Can, can we go a little deeper? Sure. What year was that? <laughs> that was 1984. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So 1984, you make mm-hmm. this, you make the decision, I'm going to get mm-hmm. baptized, you know, and I'm going to do it. Okay. Right. So along that same line, did you ever make any kind of de- commitment or declaration that Jesus was your Lord and Savior or just you just in your heart, Hey, I, I knew that I need needed to do that. Like, was there any kind of sinner's prayer or anything like that? No, there wasn't. Okay. No, nothing like that. There wasn't a, um, I guess what we would call a statement of faith. Right. Some would call a statement of faith. Right. right. I, yeah, yeah. No, there mm-hmm. wasn't. I mean, there was that. Yes. I wanted Jesus as my Lord and savior during the baptism and I was immersed. Um, so that means a, you, that means you were under the water yeah, for was, the, for the non-church <laughs> people. That means you were under the water. Okay. <laughs> yep. There we go. All right. Yep. Um, and we did it that way because that is the way Jesus was baptized. Okay. So, all right. Um, but no, there wasn't other than that, there wasn't any other statement or commitment. So did anyone help you along the way in that journey as far as like a, a like a mentor or another lady in the church that they because I mean you talk about kind of riding the Sunday school bus, so to speak, right? Getting picked up. I'm mm-hmm. imagining that that's what mm-hmm. it is, right? Because right, exactly. your parents aren't going. So you're getting picked up on the bus. Mm-hmm. They're they're taking you to and from. Maybe there's some snack along the way, some cookies, who knows? <laughs> And then you're growing up in this church and then mom says at 14 or right about there for your age, yep. 14, Hey, we're all going now, yep. but you said not everyone went now. Now, why no. didn't everyone go? Um, well, that's a good question. I looking back and I have, what's funny is I have a little Gideon Bible I carry in my car that has my dad's signature in it from when he was a kid. He was probably about 13. Um, he believed in Jesus. He did not go to church with us on a regular basis. He went on Easter and Christmas, but, um, they're going to be naive and not knowing the right questions to ask. Um, my heart tells me he did it because he was a, he didn't like people. He didn't like big crowds of people. It was hard on him. He was bashful, I guess you could say. Okay. Yeah. So he didn't go. Did your brothers go? I did. I had two brothers that ended up going. Um, they were adults. They were in their twenties. Um, one, my older brother had children, so they, uh, went to church with him and he was baptized. And then, um, what's funny is my sister-in-law going back a bit, she yeah. was baptized the same time I was, there was actually four of us. Cause I had my sister, my mom, my grandma, and my sister-in-law. Um, we were all baptized at the same time. And what church was this? What type of church was it? It was a non-denominational okay. church. Mm-hmm. Okay. So at 14, you make this decision, you get baptized. Now, now kind of take us back on that journey. What, what happens? Well, for, especially through that, um, junior high and high school age, uh, we went every Sunday. We were, we served in the church. Um, I went to Sunday school, my mom and my sisters, they worked in the, um, kids department, <laughs> helped with the kids ministry, taught Sunday school. Uh, when we jumped in, we jumped in, um, both feet. Yeah. Um, now are you serving as well? Are you helping out in yep, any way? Yes. What were you doing? Well, um, I was in the youth group, which we did a lot. We had a lot of activities. We helped with a lot of the elderly people who didn't have uh, yard help or house cleaning, things like that. You know, we, we were taught to serve them, you know, serve people who, who needed it. Uh, but we also did like Sunday, we would help get the communion ready and we had a little choir so there was about eight of us and we had a little youth choir nice and we did musicals and we got to go on uh, one fun trip uh, that we did plan we had a set of parents who had family down in california we got to go to disneyland um and there was about five of us that went so so we were active and and we were a pretty tight group of kids right And, and that was all through that junior high and high school phase so, so something happens yes what happens because i mean you're you're talking you're both feet in you're sold out i mean mm-hmm. do you feel like at this point you've really kind of turned your life over to jesus and and you're going to follow him the rest of your life at least in in your vision of, in, of how you see your life in my vision yes okay um i go to college and i went to a little school um 
in Western Oregon. So it was a smaller community, much like where I came from. Um, but it got easier to stay home. <laughs> it was uh, easier to stay home on, the, on Sunday mornings instead of go out and meet new people and be part of a new church. So that's kind of where that started. Um, I don't think my faith in Jesus faltered at that point. Um, but the habit bro was broken. Uh, so that's where it started. It was easier just to stay home and, and not put yourself out there to, to be part of a new group of people, whether I was just a naive kid. Um, okay. Yeah. So you stay home, mm -hmm. and then that kind of snowballs into other things. Mm -hmm. What right. what happens after that? Where you kind of you say the <laughs> habit got broke. So right. So what? Something must have helped break the habit, right? Yeah, and I, you, you know, thinking about it. Yeah. Um, you're in a new group of people. You're around non Christians, so it's easier to be. I don't want to call it led astray, but that's kind of what happens. But you, I don't, I don't. Um, I'm going to make it sound that easy either. Uh, yes, the habit got broken. You're around non-believers and you just become what, what your community is like or who you're with. I think if I was surrounded by um, like-minded individuals who were there to seek the Lord, I, it would have been a different outcome. My adulthood would be way different than it is or was. So. So was there anyone from that church that you grew up in? Was there anyone there that maybe as you were getting ready to make the decision to go to college and picking colleges and kind of determining post high school life? Was there anybody there that said, hey, you know, Heather, there's there's this community up here where you're going to school that could help kind of adopt you or kind of welcome you in. Was there any of that? Oh, yes. Okay. The, the pastor at the church was actually from the little town I was going to school in. Oh, good. <laughs> But that still didn't help. No, it didn't. I, and, and I don't know if it's a, it's a rebel or a defiance thing. Sure. When, you know, hit 18, I'm not doing what my mom and dad say anymore. And then you fall into this pattern. And this is awful to say. Somehow it doesn't become important anymore. That's okay. It's your, it's your opinion. Right. This is your perspective. Right. Like but we I said, pre-show. But yeah. Right. But I mean, that, that's... I guess that's a good way to say it. it. It's not important anymore. It became not important anymore yeah. to you. Not to put yeah. words in your mouth, but that's what that's I hear what, you say. Yeah. Okay. Right. It was, All right. It was, well, I'll stay home. I don't need to go. Now, did you come home from school mm -hmm. on the holidays and, mm -hmm. and whatnot? And yes. did, did you pick church right back up again? Yeah, I would So to go. speak? Yep. Okay. Oh, yeah. When we were, yeah. Um, the summers, now, when I came back to work for the summer, I worked the weekends, so that also breaks the habit a little bit. Um, was back then they had church on Sundays. You didn't have church on Saturday evenings or things like that. That's something fairly new, I think. Probably yeah. in the last Yeah, some years bigger or so. churches have Saturday yeah. uh, church. Yeah. Um, which is like a Sunday service but yep. on Saturday. Right. Yep. yep. So, yeah, when when I came back, then yeah, you were working you know, where I have a day off during the week, but there was no Sundays off. So then, then I became the go to church on Christmas and Easter. You became an, an, an EC. I believe yeah. that's the term. So if you don't yeah. know what that is, that's an EC. That means somebody that and maybe you're in this category. You only go to church mm -hmm. on Easter and Christmas. And mm -hmm. so we in the church have, have adopted the, the nickname for you. Not a, It's not a bad nickname, but you're considered an EC Christian. Right. So and that's and that's what I became. Right. Yep. Not really quite fallen away, but not really, not in it, not living it, not living for Jesus. Um, not, no, not, not wanting to live for him maybe a little bit. Cause you're kind of a little selfish right there. Or I was definitely. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like it. I mean, I don't know. I wasn't yeah, there, but yeah. it sounds like it. Definitely okay. so selfish though. So okay. Yeah. So you, so you go through college, no real church living, no real godly living, maybe right. making poor choices. Very poor choices. Okay. It's all right to say that. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, so then what, what happens? Where's, where's the moment where you say, okay, I'm, um, I'm, I'm kind of at my end now. Now what? Cool. 
Okay. Um, yeah, because I would say I lived my 20s that way, for sure. Okay. I, I was married once before. Got married in my 20s. We were just two people who should not have been married. That's the simplest way to put it. It's, it wasn't right, wrong, or otherwise. We were two people who... Sh- who we put ourselves together. We weren't a godly marriage by any means. Did you Did you get married in the church? I or did. a church? I did. Got married in the church I grew up in. Wow. <laughs> oh. Right? Yeah. Shame, shame. Wow. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. Wow. Stuff I haven't thought about in a long time, but that's okay. Okay. Good. All right. It's, All right. Nothing, well, it's nothing bad. Like I said, right. this yeah. is, that's where the beauty of Jesus comes in, right? Right. So, um... Yes, was married through my 20s. Um, then I would say right at 30, 31, our, the marriage broke up in, a, in one of the worst ways you could think of. Um, and so that put me back to church for a period. <laughs> um, Are you willing to share what broke it up? Yes. Okay. I am. All right. Um, he had an affair with one of my friends. Mm. And was he a Christian? Yes. And That's, you were a Christian at that time as well. You would categorize your, categorize yourselves. Yes. We as both Christians. Had, we'd both grown up in a church. <laughs> okay. Our his parent his mom, especially and like my mom. Very devout, went to church every Sunday. Yeah. Yes. And, and Very be, similar backgrounds. And, and to be super clear, you don't have to be, a, a, I mean, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You don't have right. to go to church to be a disciple. Well, maybe you do have to go to church if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, because Jesus does call you to, you know, be in fellowship with other believers, you know. Right. So you would consider yourself at the time of that first marriage of being a Christian couple. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I would probably even... <clears throat> would have said back then that this is a Christian marriage. Wow. <laughs> Do you laugh about that now? Well, yeah. Because you look I'm, at your I'm, now, I'm, your current marriage. Yeah, and I know your husband. He's a man. He's a man of God. I love that yeah, guy. Yes. And yeah. it's nine day different. Absolutely. Yeah, I bet it is. Day. So so he has this affair he does. with your best friend. Yes. Duh. Very good friend. Um, I read about it on the Internet. I It was the oddest thing that morning. Um, to make a long story short, what had happened is, uh, they, cause she was married, uh, as well. Um, they had moved back East and he went home. He went back there to help her move home. Me not, I'm sorry, being dumb. Sorry. That's exactly what I was. That's okay. Um, something made me get up that morning. So you need to turn the computer on. And I turned the computer on and it was like, um, it was like a novel that splayed out on the email screen. Um, I mean, there was no denying what was going on. <laughs> there was no second guessing what's going on because it was in black and white and I couldn't hide it. So, yeah, nor could he obviously. No, Yeah. no, no. So that's, yeah. And so. that was, that was the fastest thing, easiest thing I've ever done. Cause I, it was kind of strange. Um, honestly, but. Now, some would say you're a Christian. You can't get a divorce because Jesus hates divorce. The Bible says that. It does. Yeah. What would you say to that? Well, he does say in the Bible also there is one reason to get a divorce, and that is adultery. And it was it was adultery. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good answer to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But yeah, but going back and. We were two people who should not have been married. Right. I mean, the problem, the problem we had with our marriage was more than just the affair. The affair wasn't a, a symptom. As, you know, mm. as I grown up and kind of look back at things. Yeah. So. So you that this kind of pushes you back to that that church life again. Mm-hmm. It does. Um, now, why did it? Now, why did you go back to church? I mean, because again, you had this really bad divorce. You're a Christian woman. He's a Christian man. We'll say in the air quotes, um, but. I mean, of all places to go, the church? Well, that some would say go to the bar because drowns your sorrows. You know, that comes later. No. Probably a country song to that, right? <laughs> yes. You know, actually, I lost my I'm guy, sure. I lost my truck, I lost my yeah. life. You know, I'm sure mm-hmm. there's somebody who wrote something about that. But anyway, yeah. not to make light of your situation. No, by no, means, it's, but. it's all right. It's been a few years ago, so it's okay. Uh, well, this 
part of that story that morning when I found the email, there was a verse of the day that came up. <laughs> and the verse of the day was, um, oh, now I can't remember the, where it actually comes from in the Bible. Like, give me a second, I can look it up. But it's basically, it says, all the truths will be known. Nothing is in the dark will remain in the dark. It will all come out. Well, next page is here's this five page essay on what they've done for the last year. Oh, my word. So, so, um, so with my background of being a Christian and believing in Jesus, I felt God had, God had shown me this, that this, this was not right. And he was showing me the wrong, um, and so instead of instead of going the other way, and I tried to grab, pick myself up by my bootstraps and get back into church, you got to get yourself straightened out. Because you knew deep down somewhere that that's where you belonged. Yes. Right? Would, would that yes. be fair to say? Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, okay. But then. But then. Uh-oh. But then. Six months after that, my father passes away. So, what, um, and probably not being back in the faith long enough, I didn't turn away um, right away, but then I got mad at God. I got very angry with him, because how dare he, (laughs) you know, take my dad. So, I spent... um, I would say a long time mad at him, probably a good eight years at least, easily, angry with him. And so I was going to do everything the opposite that he wanted me to. So if he says, hey, go love this person, you're going to be like, nope, hating that person. Yep, exactly. Go minister to that person. Go bring them a, go bring them a meal because maybe they've had a, a, you know, a surgery or whatever. And that's kind of what some people do when there's something like that. You're like, right. oh, nope, not doing that. Nope. I wasn't doing any of that, so did all the <sighs> did all the opposite. Did the bar hop in? <laughs> um, all of that, yeah, totally turned away. And like I said, for a good chunk of time, and because here I was, now divorced, my dad dies, so my life was turned completely upside down. What do you feel like your value was like in those days? I was worthless. That that was your view of yourself. Yes, yeah. I wasn't. I wasn't worthy to be loved. I obviously couldn't keep a man or keep a husband happy. Um. And that was my punishment. Was God had my took my dad. Hmm. Um, again, that's a very selfish view. Now. Kind yeah. Of looking back. Yeah. No. Looking back. Yeah. Um. But yeah. No. So, now, in that same respect, yeah. I think, because I was so angry with him, um, and I, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but I feel it's okay to be angry with him because I never denied his presence. I never denied Jesus, Jesus' presence. I just denied what they wanted for me, the submission, um, the life they wanted for me. I was like, no, I'm not going to do that because... I had all this and now it's all gone. You took that from me. Um, again, that's a very selfish view. Um, but I don't think anyone would blame you for having that view, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just mm-hmm. speculating here that right. if we're, if, if you're not in the church, right, which you kind of really were, weren't, you know, whatever, that is a, I, I've heard people say to me, you know, who I'm even affiliated with who say, well, you know, I'm blaming God for that. Or God did that to me. You mm-hmm. know, if God is, if your God is so great, Heather, why did he allow that to happen? Why is he allowing all the kids in Africa to die and your dad die and all this other, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, that's just the snowball that just gets going. Right. So I think, I, I think you're, I don't want to say you're right in feeling that, but I think you're at least in your mindset, you're right in what you're thinking. Yes. If yes, that makes it sense. was, um, yeah. right. Yeah. I think if having a relationship though, with a church body, having other Christians around me, if I was close to anyone, um, I don't, 
I don't think my life would have gone as far as it did down that trail or as for as long as it did. Cause there'd still be periods of time where I would go to church maybe for a couple Sundays in a row. <laughs> nice job. You know, right. You feel good <laughs> and, for a while. Yeah. Oh, that was great. That was good. Then you wouldn't go for six months or whatever, but, right. but, um, my heart was definitely not in it, not in the right way. Um, uh, and I don't feel, I still don't feel God was punishing me now. Looking back, I probably did at that moment in time. Um, but now I don't, he wasn't punishing me. And he never, he never, he never left me either. Um, he had me by the shirt tail. He, I never went too far gone, but I was, um, def- definitely did some things I should not have done. Um. But what brings you back? Oh, well. Because one. at this point in your <laughs> life, right, did the church do any kind of shunning to you when you got the divorce, by the way? We, we didn't really talk about that, but. No, okay. but there again, I wasn't, I wasn't plugged into a you, church. You weren't connected, so right. I wasn't, it, it didn't, your divorce didn't phase them. You're not like right. in leadership or anything like that or leading right. a care group or. You know, no, I wasn't in running, any of that. Running so, a so uh, no. children's ministry or anything. Okay. No. So your divorce had no like ripple effects as far as church leadership or anything like that. No. Okay. No. No, because I wasn't plugged in anywhere. Right. Um, okay. So no. No. It didn't. So so there's no shunning there. That's good. No. So then you come back. What what it what happens there? Because you have this prodigal journey, which really at that point you're probably done. I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of people would be done. Right. The divorce. The death. Mm-hmm. Hashtag right. I'm out, God. Right. Peace. And then have fun. Know, I spent seven, eight years by by myself. I didn't have a relationship with any significant other <laughs> um, that meant anything that had any value to it. Anyway, um, I did when my da- dad passed away. Lived with mom, which was good. That was good for us. We were there for each other. You know, it was just us two ladies. <laughs> And mom needed help. So what, what else was I supposed to do? So, right. and it was, it was good. That was okay. I'm, I'm happy because, um, seven years later, I meet Eric, my new husband. Now, where did you meet Eric at? We met on a blind date. <laughs> yes. I'm laughing only because I know Eric and I'm trying to picture Eric on a blind day right yes, now yes and it's kind of funny to me anyway if you knew eric he would he would probably be laughing too yes on a blind date um he's a fun guy i was real i was heard about the, oh i know this person who knows this person he says they should, you guys should meet and i was like yeah whatever um we met now we weren't christians we weren't didn't go to church we did not live a christian lifestyle um but a year and a half after we met, we did get married. And then we had a baby. Um, she is what <laughs> brought me back. Because what you won't do for yourself, you'll do for your child. So you you don't have to, but what's your daughter's name? Landry. Landry. And she's named after? Tom Landry. I love that. That's Tom why I asked that. I knew that already. Yep. So yeah, Tom Landry. Um, yeah, I yeah. knew that already. And I like that. Yes. I really do. Cause Tom Landry is a great coach. Yes. He is. a Yes. And I am a Dallas Cowboys fan. So we're when, not going to hold that against you, but you. We'll, we'll move on. From <laughs> we won't, we won't go far. into yeah. too in depth there. Wrong show. Wrong show. <laughs> right. But, but I, so how does Landry bring you back? Well, with, through Jesus, Landry brings you right. back. Obviously um, give credit where credits due. Right, in your mind, I'm guessing. Right. Right. I said, Eric and I did not leave a Christian lifestyle, but I believe God had made Eric for, for me. He was who I was supposed to be waiting for. Mm. Um, I was 39 when I had Landry. So she was a gift to me from God. And that's, that's how I've always viewed her. Um, when she got old enough... I said, okay, it's time for time to get back into church because she's going to learn what the world learned. She's not going to learn what God wants her to learn. The world's going to teach her about God, and that's not who I want her to know. Because I still, I still believed. 
I still believed in Jesus. I, I knew there was better out there. And I wanted that for her. Or I want that for her. Um, I want her to grow up with a stronger connection than I, I did. So she doesn't go through the trouble and the tribulation like I did. Or at least she has a stronger footing. She has a stronger foundation than I did um, when she grows up. So. Hmm. So a couple of things jump out at me. <clears throat> I've had youth kids on previous shows say, my parents made me go to church. Mm -hmm. Do you feel when she's a teenager, because she's almost, I mean, she's not quite a teenager yet. Right. She's a preteen. Mm -hmm. She's almost as old as 80. 80 will be 12 at the end of the month. Yep. She's so, nine. She's so. nine. She's mm -hmm. in that. She's getting in there. That. Just getting in there. Wait. To see some oh attitude. my gosh. <laughs> just wait. It gets better. But um, but my concern is, and and I share this as a parent too, and maybe you'll share mm -hmm. this too, is are we gonna make our kids go? So are you gonna make Landry go to yes, church? Yes, I will. Okay. Um and with the hope that when she gets older, it's not, oh, I have to go because it's, oh, I can't live without this. <laughs> I can't live without the songs. I can't live without the story or the, the word of God. Um, that's my hope for her. And some of that teenage thing, I hope is just a, a bit of rebellion. Um, but I, that's where I want the foundation to come in. That, that Jesus is always in her life and he was always there to help her. Um, and the church, too. Uh, some of that, I think what happened when I was a kid, because it was my mom going to church, and yes, I still had a group of friends at church, but it was still my mom's church. <laughs> it was still, well, when my mom did this. Um, I want her somehow to get a connection that, well, this is my church home. These are my people. Um and not just mom and dads. So. How do you think you instill that into her? Um, one, by teaching the gospel to her and then not making church painful. <laughs> it shouldn't be a fight, <laughs> you know, because, yeah, there's days that we're tired. There's Sundays that we don't um, feel like getting up and going. And. I don't want it to be a fight. I want it to be a, a happy occasion while we go. And, oh, this is what's, what's to look forward to. And I think it's some of that, some of the mental attitude you can bring into it. Um, and there's fun things that they do. You know, right now, being in the elementary youth, you know, they look forward to getting their Bible books. They look forward to telling the story and the craft time. Um, somehow keeping that momentum going as they get into junior high and the and that standoffish, not wanting to be a part of this group or whatever. Um, I think that's something we're going to have to watch out for. And we've got to mentally prepare for it, um, as along with spiritually. Um, because that, that could change your attitude, and I don't want to see a change. Yeah, because, I mean, statistically speaking, mm -hmm. if kids don't make a decision... You know, uh, a declaration of faith, as, mm -hmm. as some have called it, before they leave high school. The statistically, the statistics say, boy, that's tough to say. Statistics mm -hmm. say they may never make that decision. They may not come back. Mm -hmm. They may be gone. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, <clears throat> um, when the youth group kind of did a realignment, and I'm sure you probably remember that, mm -hmm. a lot of my thought process for these shows came out of that oh. because we were asked to read this book called You Lost Me great book by the way i recommend it mm -hmm. um in fact there's a link in the show notes if you're still like on the fence like should i read it should i not go read it please <laughs> i don't they're not paying me to this isn't they're not endorsing this show nor am i uh, i'm endorsing the book but but i'm not getting any royalties or anything like that from it mm -hmm. but it's just a fascinating book from my standpoint because you know growing up growing up a youth guy growing up even in mm -hmm. the church now most of my friends who I know who are my peers, mm -hmm. some of them don't want anything to do with church, nothing. And they grew up in the church. They grew up in Christian homes. They grew up when mom and dad went to, you know, Wednesday night, Saturday night, anytime the church doors were open, they were there. And mm -hmm. so I don't know if because they never really got the deep roots of their own faith, 
if that's why they walked away or if they just were forced to go that that's why they walked away. I mean, I don't know. There's so many different reasons. And so we, uh, Elizabeth and I, there's a mention, honey, um, we're fully aware of that too, that Mm -hmm. there's this idea that kids walk away and trying to prevent that. So it's great to hear what you're saying Mm -hmm. on that as far as like trying to prevent that from, from Landry. So just a couple of things I want to kind of, uh, dig into a little deeper and, and that is this idea that during that kind of eight year period or that, that prodigal period, if you mm-hmm. will, um, what, what would it, what, what would you have said to yourself now back then? Like you could go back in time and talk to that Heather. I don't know how old you were and, and you don't have to t- say, but, um, but what would you have said to that Heather back then <laughs> um, from the Heather now, from the like Heather. the, the Heather now right now Mm -hmm. goes back in time to again whatever year that was however old you were what would you say to that heather one grow up (laughs) (laughs) Um, strike one there we are grow grow up up. okay like it and um get yourself get yourself mentally right because i don't think it, it was it was spiritual brokenness sure but i think a lot of it was mental too um but get yourself around good people. I wasn't around faith-based people either. Um, you're a product of your environment, some somewhat. And if I would have been mature enough, I could have. I think I could have um, taken care of some of the wrongs that happened, like the bad marriage and and things like that. If um, I wasn't so, oh, I'm. 24 and I need to get married. No, it's okay not to. You <laughs> you need to be, um, your salvation's more important than that. <laughs> There's other things that, um, to life besides the, oh, woe is me. Look, look what my life turned out to be. No, you, I had some control over that and I could have made a lot better choices and I didn't. So that's where the maturity part. I think would play into it. So, so on that same level, why do you think people are leaving the church? Young people, especially young people today, in your opinion, um, what are we failing maybe as a church and not, and, and I'm not specifically talking about our current church, but right. Just cause just, Heather and I go to church together if it wasn't mentioned, but, but we do go to church together. So not that that matters any, but kind of, does. I think part of it is selfishness. Um, because God wants us to live, live a certain way. And he wants us to be submissive to his plan. Um, so part of that is, no, I'm not doing that. I'm going to do it my way. Um, and the other part is, I think when you do get out of high school, I remember kind of floundering, even going to college. There's no firm, there was no firm support base. There was... Um, Like I said, there was no other Christians in my life. There was not, at that time, uh, the church I went to was, it ended up being an older church, which, and that's all right. It was a lot of older people, but there was not um, a place for somebody in that 18, 19 year old age group to feel like they belonged. There wasn't a care group, which we have care groups now, which I absolutely love because even if you're having an off day or an off week, to, <laughs> that still plugs you in with other talk people. About a, talk about what a care group is. We, well, we haven't had anybody do that yet. So talk about what a care okay. group is. So, well, we a care group is, um, and is a group of people. We study scripture. We study the gospel. But we also are a group of people who, who have each other's backs, who um, support each other no matter what we tend to be going through. We pray for each other, and we love each other. <laughs> so it's it's a great support system too, right? It so is. if you're struggling with something, if especially being a mom and mm-hmm. and a wife and, and and a career woman and all right. this stuff, right? So if you you're juggling all these uh, proverbial stuff in the air, right? Mm-hmm. You can go there. You can be real. You can be honest and say. <laughs> I blew it this week as a mom. Not that that ever happens because moms are perfect, right? But I blew it this week as a wife. Wait, wives are perfect too. So maybe not. <laughs> but you know, you get my point. Right. Hopefully the the point comes across is the fact that 
they're there to support you. Right. You can be real with those people. Right. Um, and yeah. And, and they're there to help. They're not there to judge whatever circumstance <laughs> you're in. I guess some of that too, you get that judgmental feeling from other others just in the world in general. But yeah, it, you just have a support base. You have somewhere to turn to when, when life gets a little rocky. So You have some cheerleaders on the sidelines. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. Or even in the game if you need them in the game for you, you right. know, so to speak. Okay. Right. So you didn't have any of that when you left high school? No. And you obviously didn't find any of that in college? No. Can you imagine if you had had a care group when you left high school? I, yeah, like, and even when you started college, I know that's kind of the same time period, but yeah, 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 or even when you were going through your marital problems, right? Yeah, on the first go round, um, right, because yeah, when when dad did pass away, there would have been somebody there to to help with the hurt, you know. By then, I was broken one way, and then then I just fell apart by the time he died when that happened. That, yeah, yeah. so yeah, yeah, care group. They are essential. So, yeah. Okay. So, um, anywhere along the way, anybody disciple you? No. I would say no. Why do you think discipleship is so important for you? Um, and this is going to sound funny, but discipleship is new to my vocabulary. As is, as it is to me. <laughs> so that's funny. Yes. It's not something when growing up or even in my early adulthood, it was talked about. I probably didn't hear the Great Commission until maybe five or six years ago when we started to come back into to the church. And you're like, the Great Commission. And then you read the passage. You're like, oh, yep. That's what he tells us to do. Go out and make fish. You know, you're a fisher of men and you are to go make disciples. Um, I think discipleship, what it means to me, um, one, is to be a better follower of Jesus, but also to go pre to go spread his word to other people, but then also be a group together, have a Christian fellowship with one another. Um, and that way you, nobody's left out on the branch by themselves. We're all in this together. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. So, uh, again, going back to this book, you lost me. There are, uh, six reasons why they cite people or young people leave mm -hmm. the church. So let's see if you fell into any of these categories. So uh, I'm going to read the, the reason, and then if you want to agree or disagree with it, and then maybe an explanation or something, if sure. something comes to mind that you want to respond to it. So here we go. And these are in no particular order. Reason number one, church seems overprotective. So think maybe back to when you were first starting out, maybe in that, mm -hmm. you know, high school, you know, adolescent years. Maybe not now, or maybe, yeah. maybe now, I don't know, yeah. wherever your point of reference is, but uh, church seems overprotective. That's why people leave. Uh, I didn't feel over. If anything, I felt less protected. <laughs> but that's that's looking back. That's not right. being in the middle of it right. too. Um, I, I, not for me anyway. I'm sure it is for others, but okay. I didn't you, feel you, overprotective. You never. By any means. You never felt the church was overprotective. No. Okay. Uh, reason number two: teens and twenty somethings' experience of Christianity is shallow. You kind of alluded yeah, to that a little bit. I would, yeah, that would definitely. You would agree yes. with that, that that not taking deep roots, and we, we right. kind of talk about that too. So, uh, reason number three: uh, churches come across antagonistic towards science. I can understand that. Yeah. How so? Um, it seems like, and I remember being a kid and dealing with this, especially when somebody brings up the dinosaurs. Oh yeah. <laughs> ah, no. Um, but I, but yeah, so I can understand that. I don't know that the church is ag, that they're against science. Antagonistic. That's Thank a tough you, word. No, it's okay. <laughs> I've said it like a um, million times wrong. So, I, but I remember that. thinking about the dinosaurs and going back and reading Moses and then the insight about the flood. And what do they say the dinosaurs died from? Yeah. A catastrophic event like a flood created by a meteor, right? Yeah. So I said, oh, okay. But I think because God is the um, first scientist, and that's where all scientists come from is him. Um, 
But yeah, I can understand why people would say that. Yeah, but, why they leave over that reason. Yeah. Okay. Young Christians today uh, experience... Or, Sorry, I can't. I don't have my glasses on today. Uh, young Christians' uh, church experience related to sexuality are often simplistic and judgmental. So, young Christians' church experience related to sexuality are often simplistic or judgmental. Yes. However, there's a way God wants us to live. And that's being, so, but that but I would think that is a selfish reason. Now this is the adult me talking, right? Not this the is kid. the adult Heather, right? But yes, I could say yes to that. Okay. Sure, yeah. But now looking back, his his ways are right. Right. It would have saved me a lot of heartache if I would have listened. <laughs> Let Heather be the voice of your guide. You don't need Jiminy Cricket anymore. You got Heather. So here we go. Or Jesus, which you know, whichever. Right. They kind of sound the same, probably in Eric's mind sometimes. Right. So there we are. Reason number five. Uh, they wrestle with the exclusive nature of Christianity. Now we talked about this last mm-hmm. Sunday as a church, mm-hmm. and I always quote this. You know, Jesus says, "I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me." Mm-hmm pretty exclusive mm-hmm. but we found out sunday he wasn't the first to say it so mm. that's a whole nother topic for another time but do you agree with uh people wrestling with the exclusive nature of christianity yes but that goes back to being selfish again because it's about them or about me my wants my wishes my first um christianity is about jesus first and then your brother and your sisters, it's, you come pretty low on the, if you stop and think about it, your wants and your wishes are up to God to give. It's not up to what you want. It's up to, to you to live the way God wants you to, and then God will help you get you things you need. So, yeah. but yeah, I think, yeah, I can understand that. Um, but I don't, again, adult Heather grown up. It's selfish, a selfish thought, too. Okay. Reason number six, church feels unfriendly to those who doubt. Oh, yes. What do you mean by that? Well, we've been to new churches, and you're not greeted. You're not. People don't say hello. Um, luckily, we have not found that here at the new church we're going to. Um, but, yes, they can be very standoffish and not want to invite new people in to their circle, <laughs> their clique, or however you want to phrase it. Um, so it feels like they're, they want you at arm's length in the beginning. They're not, maybe they're not willing to trust you, or they just don't know who you are, so they don't know how to react when you walk in the door. So, Heather, you have, in my mind, much like... Most of the ladies in my life, a very unique perspective. You're a woman. I'm not. Shocker. (laughs) Number two, you're a mom. Never going to be a mom. So you got that going for you, too. And, you know, you're also a wife. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm never going to be a wife. So you got really, in my mind, the triple threat. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to somebody out there who's a mom, Mm -hmm. maybe, Mm -hmm. you know, young mom, old mom, whatever, a Mm -hmm. mom, right? right? A wife, maybe a new wife, maybe an old wife, you know, whatever. And then, of course, a woman, those three categories. What mm-hmm. would you say to them right now about if they've had a negative church experience? What, what would you what would be your counsel to them if they came to your care group or they met you at a coffee shop? Um, you drink coffee, mm-hmm. I'm guessing. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, OK, <laughs> safe guess there. Yes. <laughs> but you met him at Starbucks or you met him, you know, someplace like we're going in to buy coffee, not one of these fancy stands that we have out here in Oregon. But mm-hmm. what would you say to them if you ran into them, bumped into them and they just started up a conversation with you? about faith what, what would you say to them um i would say first of all i'd say come with me let me show you what it should be like um let's sit down and read the bible together um because god doesn't want us segregated from one another he wants us in relationships and I think the biggest thing, especially what we see in society today with our problems and with single mom, single mom, single parents, single dads, is people need love. They need reassurance that they are okay. And a church home and can show that to her and give her um, 
some comfort knowing she's not alone. She doesn't have to face this world alone. Um, that she has someone to take her, her troubles to, that Jesus is there willing to listen. And as his disciple, I am there to listen and to help guide her to the, to the right place or to the right people to get her the support and the care she needs. You know, whether she's a single mom or just maybe they're a family, maybe they're just a, a normal family who's ready. You know, they, they just need more in their life. There's something missing. There's a piece not of the puzzle that's still missing. And, um, that I think is part of the church's uh, work as well, is um, to show them what, what, what life can be like. Can you imagine if somebody had done that to you in those in that eight year period? What would that have done to you? It would have been so different. Um, my life would have been so different. It, it there would have been some more peace. There would have been more structure. I wouldn't have felt so lost or floundering of searching for whatever, which was Jesus, um, getting back to my, getting back to him. Just, um, yeah, my life would have been so much different. So, so different. Do you feel like there were Christians in your life? No. At that time? No. I could, And I can say that honestly, I didn't. I, I went the church that I would go to was big so I could hide. So I didn't have to know people and I didn't have to build relationships. So some of that's on me too. Um, but no, they're not, not as a steady stream. So. Okay. Well, uh, Heather, we're going to play a game. Okay. And then, uh, <laughs> so this will be fun. So this is a, a die in this amazing cup. Are you allowed to touch this cup? I mean, I don't know. Oh. It's not a Cowboys it, cup. No, but Eric is. He loves Michael Jordan, so. Oh, he does love Michael Jordan. Does. Well, that's 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 the greatest thing I've ever heard about your husband. Okay, so we're going to play a game called Senseless. So you're going <laughs> to okay. roll the die, and then based on what you roll, you get to answer a question. Oh. Isn't that fun? Yes. Yeah, so you get to roll it. So okay. just roll it. Roll it. It's like Yahtzee. There we go. Ooh, oh. you got number six. Dun, dun, yes. dun. Yes. I love number six. It's my favorite question, by the way. <laughs> okay. So here we go. Here's senseless uh, question number six, and that is this. Uh, dinner. Now, I don't know what you're having for dinner. That's up to you. Okay. But dinner with one person dead or alive, who would it be? Oh. I don't have to have one? Sorry. It's only one. Yeah. I mean, judges might allow two, but but really it's it's supposed to be one. I would love to have, this is going to sound so odd. I would love to have dinner with John F. Kennedy. Yes. You got to explain that one. Come I, on, we can't let that sit. No, I know. I um, I mean, the last time he was in Dallas, bad things happened to him. Did. So I just so, want to put that out there. So maybe that's why I don't like Dallas so much. No, I'm just kidding. That's terrible. Well, <laughs> well, anyway, um, why John F. Kennedy? Because I... I there is so much depth to him. Mm. Um, not only was he a war hero, he was part of a large family in America who um, I think some people think they were more like royalty. Mm. But I think there is more to him than even the stories you hear about him now. And there, his pres- because he was assassinated, his presid- presidency wasn't finished. And there's just so I think there's so much to to know about him, so much to learn about who he was. Um, what would be your number one question for him? Oh, um, his my number one question for him would be. Um, oh gosh, that's a good one. I have to think about that one for a second. I guess, what was it like growing up in his older brother's shadow? Because mm. he wasn't supposed to be president. Remember, there's an older one that passed away in the war. And uh, he just got elected by default. So how did that, how did that mold him? What, you know, what, what made him, did that make him who he became? Or did he go, oh, oh, now what? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. 
I never would have imagined you would have picked John F. Kennedy. That's fascinating to me already. Yes. So yes. that's awesome. Uh, okay. Yes. Well, Heather, I just want to end uh, with just just this idea. One last thing, if, you, if you're mm-hmm. willing to indulge sure. me for one more. Why do you keep coming? Because you have, I mean, really, you have every reason in the world not to go to church. I mean, you have a, a you know, pretty non-church background, let's say. You know, but, right. Mm-hmm. You know, you have every reason to stop going. But, but what really keeps you motivated to go? I love Jesus. <laughs> He's every right part of my life. He is my daughter. Um, he is my husband. He gave me Eric. Uh, I refer to Eric and I, we are matching bookends. So it's, um, my husband was hurt as a child and I don't hear from the left and he, he doesn't have the right side of his body doesn't work. So we're bookends. It's a great way to put it. Um, but even through all the pain of the past and all the dumb decisions, he never left. He never left me. He never forsook me. He never just pushed me out the door. Like I said, there's a lot of times he held me by the shirt tail. Um, but I love him. And if that means I have to give up two hours on a Sunday, eh, which I, it's not just that two hours on a Sunday, but if that's what I have to give back for a life, a life that he's given me, that's a drop in the bucket. And for those who are wondering, you would say what? Come find, come, come seek him. Come see what you're missing. Um, There's so many of us that wander this world brokenhearted and our souls and our spirits are hurt. But there's only one way to fix it, and that's Jesus. And he's there. He has his arms open. And he's ready to put him around you and welcome you home. Yeah. Awesome. Heather, thank you so much. Thank you for giving us some time today. This, of mm-hmm. course, is Other People's Shoes. I do appreciate you again coming on, Heather, and uh, giving us some some of your perspective mm-hmm. and I You're just welcome. want to remind people when you walk in other people's shoes you really do get a different perspective on life. Mm-hmm.